Good afternoon, everyone. 12.01 and we're ready for our latest virtual grand round sponsored by the California Medical Association and California Health and Human Services. We're so grateful that you're all here. Attendees are still kind of logging in, but I'll go ahead and get us started. I'm Dr. Kim Newell Green, and I'll be the moderator for today's virtual grand round, which is entitled The Nocturnist and Variants versus Vaccines in California. Next slide, please. Um, you can notice uh, here's our disclosure slide. Next slide, please. Um, this is our agenda today. We're gonna start with Dr. Khan and then move on to Dr. Emily Silverman. Next slide, please. And as a reminder, we are able to offer CME for this webinar series. Um, and just remember to get it, you have to be, you have to complete the survey that you're sent after the webinar that should happen this afternoon, you attest your attendance and then you can go ahead and get your CMA, CME certificates. Next slide, please. More than a year and a half into the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, and so many other caregivers in the healthcare system are tired. Just months ago, most of us began to feel like we could breathe again, but over the summer, we have faced a resurgence with the Delta strain of COVID-19 that makes one begin to wonder if and when it will all end. During this virtual Grand Rounds, we'll hear from Dr. Eric Pan, California State Epidemiologist and a frequent guest on this series about the state of COVID-19 in California, about efforts to keep the virus at bay and the progress on vaccinations and the hope for keeping schools open this year. We're also so honored to hear from Dr. Emily Silverman, the creator of The Nocturnists, a medical storytelling live show and podcast where healthcare workers can pause and examine their inner landscapes. The Nocturnist helps just to examine the forces that drive burnout and moral distress. And in doing so provides hope that we can find ways to flourish in the face of the extreme stresses of medical practice in general and practice in the setting of a pandemic in particular. I'm thrilled to hear from both of these speakers as we all seek information and solace as COVID-19 remains a prominent force in all of our lives. Just remember, please do submit any questions you have on the presentation using the question box in the control panel which is located on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll go over those questions at the end of the presentation. Now, I'd like to turn over the time to Dr. Erica Pan. Thank you again, Erica, for stepping away from your busy role as our state epidemiologist and taking the time to join us. Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kim, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and I will launch right in. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, just to give a quick overview of what I plan to cover this uh, afternoon, want to just give you some updates on our trends. Um, there's a lot of interest, of course, in pediatric data, so can show you what we um, what we are seeing in California. Um, we are really starting to report out and look at our unvaccinated versus vaccinated rates and want to share that with you, um, some overall vaccination updates. Um, and then really touching on safe and successful schools, because I know that's top of mind for all of us. Um, and with the theme of today, just um, have some resources, although I think I'll mostly defer to Dr. Um, Silverman about um, burnout, but just some, some from a public health perspective. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. So, um, you know, uh, Kim sort of started to allude to this, you know, last uh, May and early June, we were really quite optimistic and things were looking great. Um, we am also proud to say in general um, how well we're doing as a state. You can see that in early June, we were one of the only big states and the first to be in the lowest levels. If you look at the CDC levels of transmission, the, the order that they go in is blue, yellow, orange, and red. So red is the worst, of course, and blue is the lowest. And so in early June, we were in a great um, place, the lowest case rates, lowest test positivity in the nation. Um, we did reopen in mid-June and most importantly, Delta um, came upon us. Um, and so we've had this surge recently, but you can see actually, once again, we are the big sort of state on the West Coast that is actually the first to be uh, back down in the orange and we are seeing some good trends. Next slide. 
Uh, this is our dashboard, um, again, to just show like our overall test positivity has been decreasing. Um, our deaths certainly lag behind the peak of cases, so we may see, we may not have peaked there yet, um, but watching that closely. Um, and then again, our case rates have, they're still pretty high. They are um, what would be kind of what I would have called deep purple when we have the blueprint for a safer economy at 22 um, cases per 100,000 per day, but again, on the decrease. Next slide. So this is sort of a, a snapshot of the overall epidemic curve over this entire pandemic. Um, so many of you have seen this uh, other times I've been speaking here and you can see this time our Delta surge was a little bit higher as far as the number of cases that we peaked at compared to last summer. Um, and our hospitalizations, it was interesting, varied regionally for sure across the state, um, but similar or higher in many parts of the state to the summer surge. And in some parts of the state, um, and certainly San Joaquin Valley is still feeling um, the burden of high hospitalizations along with having a lot of other non-COVID hospitalizations in their hospital setting. But um, so in some areas, again, higher than even the winter surge and in others, similar or slightly higher than the summer surge. Uh, and then you can see the black line as the ICU levels. And then again, the lagging um, and lower number of deaths. I do think proportionally as well, vaccines have really helped us have lower numbers of deaths compared to prior surges. Um, and then you can just sort of see when we achieved, for example, 60% of our 16 and older is fully vaccinated in mid-June. Next slide. Um, and this I just wanted to touch on, and this is a little bit of a teaser um, uh, to really be thinking about and maybe as a future topic to dive in a little deeper on, but um, this is kind of looking at the spectrum of different levels of COVID-19 infection. Um, and I think really my purpose here was to highlight that um, monoclonal antibodies have been, uh, you know, something that has been logistically challenging um, but more recently are now available for subcutaneous um, injections. So it's not as logistically um, challenging to do the IV infusions. And they're really the most helpful actually with mild illness or moderate illness to prevent hospitalization. So you can sort of see at the bottom of this, this diagram. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, really, again, they've been helpful for early treatment and also post-exposure prophylaxis has been a newer thing to consider for monoclonal antibodies. Um, we are gearing up to do some updated advisories and communications around this. Um, with the national surge, we're certainly seeing a constraint on the supply again. For a long time, actually, there was um, not enough demand to to even use up our supply. And now I think we just got a notification in the last day that um, instead of directly ordering from the manufacturer, it's gonna be coming through the states again. So we'll be updating providers on uh, that process, which is similar to how it was early on in the pandemic. But just a quick reminder here on who's eligible for monoclonal antibody. It's really, again, people have mild to moderate disease. So you're really trying to prevent people from getting into the hospital um, 12 and up. And then um, you want to really prioritize this treatment for people who are at high risk for progressing to hospitalization or other um, complications. So you can see the list of high risk conditions that um, are the criteria for use of, of monoclonal antibodies and um, kind of a clarification of who's not eligible. So again, more to come on this. We're um, hoping to send some more um, health advisories out along with um, updated patient flyers. Our EMSA partners and many of our local partners have already put things out, but um, just a reminder to people as another way to prevent the burden on the hospital system and how to prevent more serious disease. So um, more to come on that, uh, but wanted to make sure it's on people's radar. Next slide. And then uh, turning to think about pediatrics. So um, uh, there's been a lot of national attention as well to the the high burden in uh, pediatric hospitals and seeing a lot more pediatric hospitalizations and certainly we are seeing in california an increase in cases in children um so you can see here um on these slides the highest age group um on the left shows the 18 to 49 year olds so young adults and up to 49 are the highest peak that we've seen in this delta surge and um thankfully again the decrease and then the other thing that really changes are zero to 17 year olds um, had been lower than other age groups, but really have now surpassed uh, the older age groups in this recent surge. And then when you break that down to 22 years of age and under, you can also see here that um, the, the highest age groups are the 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 year olds. When you look at this data a different way, next slide, 
trying to think about the proportion of cases over time, you can see that, you know, in our older population, the proportion of cases actually decreased in the most elderly. So, and I think that's where we do have our highest vaccination rates. Um, pretty similar, uh, stable in the 50 to 64 year old range as far as the proportion of our cases. Um, and then some decreases in the um, 18 to 49 years of age and seeing some increasing proportions in our pediatric age groups. And then if you look um, just in our pediatric age groups, next slide. What's also interesting to see here is that in our 12 to 17 year olds where um, we have a lot of progress we need to make in our vaccination rates, but where we do have vaccines available, the proportion of cases has actually decreased from 48% of our pediatric cases to 40%, and where we're seeing the biggest increases as far as proportionality is in the five to 11 year olds. Next slide. And here's though um, another thing to help put this all in context. So this is a really a uh, graphic to look at overall testing volume, which is the bars, the gray bars, and then testing positivity. So we've seen a huge increase over the last few weeks in testing of our school-aged children, five to 11 year olds, so you can see this high testing volume, but decreasing test positivity. So as kids are back in school, as there have been um, some places that are actually having testing, of, you know, for extracurricular activities or athletics, we are seeing again a lot of testing in kids, and so a huge increased volume, and we're case finding, which is good because then we are isolating those um, children and uh, quarantining the close contacts. But we are seeing a decrease again in test positivity. But um, this is, you know, I think our hypothesis around this is as schools reopen and we are using testing to find cases early and we are find, uh, seeing more and that's part of the increase in proportion of cases. Next slide. And this illustrates a similar theme as far as our teenagers as well. High testing volume, but lower test positivity. But how is that impacting our hospitalizations? Next slide. So I think the reassuring thing here and the message is, yes, we're seeing an increase in pediatric cases. Um, and, uh, you know, as I just highlighted in our age range that is um, has some proportion vaccinated, we're seeing a lower proportion, but it has not dramatically uh, changed our pediatric hospitalization. So I'd say overall, not actually on this slide, but less of all of our COVID hospitalizations, both in the winter surge and now, uh, less than two to three percent of our overall hospitalizations have been pediatric. So you can see these scales. The orange line is the overall new admissions for all hospitalizations. Um, so last winter and then this Delta surge and that's in the hundreds of thousands and really our peak um, during this Delta surge has been, you know, under uh, 40 or 50. So a much lower scale and has not um, even reached the number of hospitalizations we had in the winter surge and uh, is on the decrease again. So I do think this is a testament to California having um, higher vaccination rates than a lot of these states that are seeing a large pediatric burden, uh, as well as a lot of our other interventions as far as uh, masking and other just um, sort of support of a lot of public health interventions has really protected our kids, which is, you know, I think a common goal for all of this. Uh, next slide. And then how is that looking as far as pediatric deaths? So thankfully, we have only had 33 pediatric deaths in California during this entire pandemic. So um, obviously every death that we can prevent, we want to though. So we're really looking forward to having, um, uh, again, more teenagers vaccinated. And once we do have vaccine approved for under 12 to be able to start vaccinating our younger children. I've been getting the question a lot from public and the media, well, um, how does this compare to flu? So in our serious flu seasons, uh, 17, 18, and 1920, um, and that's in the confines of the flu season definition, we had under 25 deaths total. And so uh, over the course of this whole pandemic, we had again, 33. And I think there's gonna be some time lag potentially during this last surge, there may be more. So um, it's not magnitudes higher than uh, severe flu seasons, but as you can see, some of our low flu seasons, we've had much fewer. So definitely more serious than uh, flu in California. I think the other big difference here to show is that uh, as you all know, uh, children under two uh, specifically and under five in some situations are at higher risk for flu complications. And so our median age of pediatric deaths is much lower for flu, whereas in COVID, I think with between the MISC and, um, and just a different median age in pediatric deaths. And then just showing you um, some of the unfortunate disparities we've seen as well as far as um, our Latino deaths from COVID and our Black deaths are 
um, disproportionate in our pediatric population compared to um, other races and ethnicities and a little bit different than actually our flu data. Next slide. So, uh, you know, also just want to encourage people to, again, you know, we have slowed down in our vaccination um, sort of administration per week. So this is kind of looking at, uh, you know, we had a peak uh, in late April when we opened up eligibility to everybody um, and then a decrease again in our vaccinations per week. And then we've had an increase um, over the last several weeks at first when Delta was increasing and also I think increasing vaccine requirements in different settings. Um, and now that rate has started to go down again, but we have administered almost 48 million doses, which is encouraging, but again, we still have work to do. Next slide. Um, so this is just some um, information from the De Beaumont Foundation that's done a lot of helpful work with um, focus groups and surveys to really, um, you know, how are we going to get these last proportions of people who are unvaccinated vaccinated? There's a lot of different things, and obviously there's different audiences that different things resonate with, but some key tips that um, have been noted nationally in some of these surveys and focus groups are to use certain words, um, preferably over others, when you're working with your patients and, and really working to um, encourage them to get vaccinated. So uh, uh, the word vaccination is much more preferable than injection or shot, uh, and really emphasizing the safe and effectiveness uh, versus that it was developed quickly, that it's been authorized by the FDA based on clinical testing, uh, that you want to make sure they're getting the latest information um, but that and that it can be changing but not um, necessarily emphasizing the things we still don't know. Um, the thing that was really resonating with people as well, um, including people that have moved you know, to, from being undecided to be vaccinated is really keeping your family safe, keeping those that are most vulnerable safe as opposed to um, you know, sort of your country or a larger organization. And public health versus government, as far as um, referring to other references, uh, and just people um, resonate more with thinking about health and medical experts and doctors versus scientists. Uh, and really, I think a really important one is as we continue to try to increase our vaccination rates, understanding that people may have questions and with all the misinformation out there, they may truly have that misinformation and might be still curious and have important questions to be answered. Um, but using that and vaccine confidence rather than vaccine hesitancy or other tips to use when you're talking to your patients about getting them vaccinated. Next slide. Um, this is sort of a nice correlation slide to show you across the, the counties in California. We do see that the areas with um, the highest case rates tend to have the lowest vaccination coverage. And so, um, you know, when you kind of do the extrapolation across the board, you see that theme. So, and we've done a similar graphic for um, intensive care unit and hospitalizations, and we'll be working to get something um, that's a little more um, public friendly as far as just more visual um, an infographic on this out in the near future, but wanted to just, you know, again, hit home that, you know, I think you all know this, I'm probably preaching to the choir in this audience, but again, higher vaccination coverage means lower case rates and vice versa. Next slide. Uh, and then there was some recent data uh, just last week, actually, that came out from the CDC about vaccine effectiveness. And I think some bottom line things, many of you may have seen these, I can look at these slides or the references later, but um, some bottom line messages are that, yes, we have seen with this Delta surge and a change in behaviors, we have seen um, uh, breakthrough or post-vaccination cases, but vaccines remain very effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. So the numbers have been still 85 to 90 percent as far as preventing um, uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths. So I think that is sustained. I think we have seen less protection with from the Delta variant with our vaccines compared to Alpha variant and the, the Wuhan original um, for asymptomatic infection or infection. But we're also seeing more data too, and I think more to come on this, that people who are vaccinated when they do have an infection, they tend to, um, while they may be very infectious while they're, uh, especially if symptomatic, they tend to become uh, non-infectious sooner than unvaccinated. Um, people. And in California, uh, we have some slightly different numbers that we have. This is national data that showed the increase in rates as far as 5, 10, and 10 for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Next slide. 
But here in California, our cases are actually, our unvaccinated uh, cases, our case rates are eight times higher than our unvaccinated hospitalizations are 12 times higher and deaths are 20 times higher in the unvaccinated versus the vaccinated. And this is basically a big cross match of the um, almost 23 million people who are fully vaccinated in our registries with um, all of our cases reported. And then you can see on the left-hand side a very, very, very small proportion of those almost 23 million who have been um, the cases themselves. This is cumulative data um, and then the number that were hospitalized or deaths. And um, amongst the deaths, we have seen that a large proportion of them have had comorbidities or elderly. Um, we are continuing to take deeper dives on how many of those might have been tested for COVID, but not still they, the primary cause of death. And definitely not all 400 of those were um, was COVID the primary cause of death. And similar with hospitalization, I think as we ongoing monitor, we're trying to work with our healthcare system to better understand how many were cases that were tested on admission, but not necessarily hospitalized for COVID versus um, with COVID um, and again, incidental findings. Next slide. And then of course, really the hot topic and things we're preparing for are, um, was uh, as you all know, in August, um, since we last met, booster doses were approved for the immunocompromised. And uh, these are some references that um, really showed and helped try to decide based on looking at um, and I think what's really important about these, this approval is that these booster doses were to help boost the initial response to, um, to vaccination in the immunocompromised. So not even necessarily boosting a response that was waning. This is really to say this population can actually benefit from a third dose because to actually improve their response and their response may still be lower than other healthy individuals. Um, so there were different titers, <clears throat> excuse me, titers looking at neutralizing antibodies and antibodies. And one of these um, parameters also looks at um, cell mediated immunity as well. And the next slide I think talks about the who the populations are. So this is who um, is actually recommended now to actually get that third dose. And so we have seen an increase in additional doses. We think probably at least a third or so um, based on numbers that increased after this authorization of the population we estimate to be immunocompromised in California has gotten those third doses. Um, what we're of course waiting to hear more, there's a VRBAC meeting on Friday to be looking at um, the data to support boosters for others, whether it's the elderly, um, and whether otherwise healthy people. And as you all know, there's a lot of controversy on this issue. I think it'll be really helpful and interesting to see the Verback findings um, this Friday. And um, we're waiting to hear more from the FDA and then subsequently the ACIP um, Advisory Committee to the CDC and CDC on what recommendations may be um, coming for boosters in other populations. So more to come on that. And we're certainly um, working with a lot of you and your large health systems and pharmacies to be planning for the potential for boosters uh, in the coming weeks. And I do think, you know, uh, depending on if there are recommendations about six months versus eight months after you finish your last vaccination, it can really put a stress again on our healthcare system and on vaccinators. So really ramping up again, working with a lot of you as partners to think about that and have been looking at projections based on that. Um, the other common question, just to, to mention it now, is as far as um, the five to 11 year old vaccines, um, you know, the latest we're hearing is sort of mid to late October is when those might be, um, that data might be ready and, and hopeful approval for that age range. So that may coincide with um, the recommendations for boosters and we're trying to calculate that in our state projections. Next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on uh, schools because again, that's as we are here in September and the fall and has been one of our most important um, things to keep our eyes on. I'm also proud, you know, I showed you other national comparisons about how California is doing. All 20 of the largest school districts um, in California have reopened in the state. Um, some of them, um, you know, several, a few weeks ago already. This is a, a site called Burbio that looks at schools that have had to close across the country. And we've had a very very low number here in California so far. Um, and this is with the caveat that New York State just opened this week, or certainly New York City. Um, we have seen a lot of these closures, especially in this rural northern part that you see on this um, map, actually more due to staffing, um, you know, staffing shortage from uh, staff, unvaccinated staff actually being infected and needing to stay home. Um, and still, not um, not concerning evidence of even what the Delta variant in school transmission, but we're watching this closely. Next slide. 
Um, and then just wanted to give a quick background on what's called the ABC Collaborative. It was a multi-institution academic consortium. You can see these different partners across the country. Um, they actually, a lot of the evidence that they put together based in North Carolina over several districts was what informed our school's guidance around um, indoor masking and also feeling that we, knowing of the priorities in-person instruction, given all the learning loss and social and mental health losses over last year, um, but also this data really helped us you know uh, to make some decisions in California about not necessarily having to have a minimum physical distancing. Um, and their secondary attack rate in these schools that used all the mitigation efforts as far as masks um, and other things that their secondary attack rate was extremely low. Um, they did see some transmission in athletics um, outside of the school setting, but this is what helped guide a lot of our guidance in California. Next slide. Including one thing I just wanted to highlight because I know it's caused certainly some confusion, um, but just wanted to explain a little rationale because I know many of you who are primary care providers for kids may be getting these questions or if you have kids in school are wondering how this works and maybe some of the rationale again behind it. So typically prior outside of schools, you know, if someone is um, exposed to a positive COVID case, we do recommend, recommend quarantine, um, meaning isolating or quarantining from all other people. Uh, because of that data and that ABC collaborative in the North Carolina schools, and the CDC also had some guidance around this, you can do something called modified quarantine. So, if, and part of the rationale of having indoor masking in the K through 12 setting is if everybody's wearing a mask, both people, the case and the exposed contact, if the exposed student, the contact remains asymptomatic and ideally can also go through this twice weekly testing, then the the exposed case um, can stay in school under what we call modified quarantine. And again, we want to make sure they get tested. Um, there was a recent study from the MMWR with this practice in a university setting as well, and they had um, definitely much, much higher um, secondary cases for people that um, were not masked and uh, reinforced that there's a much lower risk of having um, exposure with, with both people wearing those masks. So that's, and the, the idea is we've been trying to balance safe, meaning low transmission, and successful meaning as much in-person instruction as possible this has been kind of a a method that we wanted to um, allow for schools to do to try to keep kids in seats when it's low risk so that is what the rationale is and you know we're continuing to learn from people on the ground and schools on the ground and trying to resource schools and local health departments to respond to these situations and we know it's caused confusion but wanted to again explain what the rules are and what the rationale is next slide and then just some highlights here about um, what we've been doing at the state level to respond to schools as far as TA, um, um, especially with outbreak mitigation. Um, we've actually deployed teams for on-site consultation for testing and vaccines. Um, and then uh, just a picture of some on-site testing clinics. Next slide. So I know we're running short on time, so I'll just quickly highlight there was also an MMWR on our public health workforce and so many of us in public health um, you know first got it activated in January of 2020 so it has been a long long haul um, and I think we would all sort of um, communicate that we were under resourced and understaffed to do even our, our, our baseline jobs much less responding to a pandemic of this magnitude so we have certainly seen public health burnout for sure as well um, and there are many symptoms of stress um, that we have seen across our public health workforce and really trying to help improve our ability to rotate people out and give people breaks um, and hire more staff. But we're having um, really difficulties across the board at the local and state level trying to hire more individuals as well. Um, so lots of burnout that we're, we're working on. Next slide. And then just to call out, and I know there's going to be a lot more great conversation about this after me about other healthcare worker burnout. And so again, I'm not going to walk through all these details, but some other data that um, is out there from Medscape and um, other healthcare workers about the the proportion of people that are feeling that um, various mental health or other um, symptoms of, of burnout from this very very long response. Next slide. These are some tips and constructive tips for both employers on managing um, employee workplace burnout and tips for individuals on managing fatigue. So I think all of us need to do a better job of, you know, putting our, our oxygen on first before we take care of others. And um, there's that other book about taking your own pulse first before your patients, but really trying to take care of ourselves. So here are some 
some guidance on that. And again, I imagine there'll be some great conversation um, around the Nocturnus next after as well. Next slide. So in closing, I think I just wanted to, um, I actually, prior to the pandemic and hope to get my own <laughs> self-care and exercise back on track, but um, have been a triathlete and I've been thinking about this pandemic as uh, it's uh, a professional iron, iron man. And I think we have been at this last stretch, we, we were in the middle of the marathon at the end of the iron man and they sort of changed the course a bit. And we had this Delta competitor get thrown in who's faster and stronger and fitter. But I think most importantly, and what has really kept me going is just the aid stations along the way and knowing that it's a team effort, whether it's healthcare providers in the front lines, like many of you and our public health colleagues across the, the local and state and actually national level. And we're all here together and we're gonna get to that finish line. This will be at some point another vaccine preventable disease and we're gonna get to beyond that if we can continue vaccinating and continue all the great measures that all of you are doing the front lines, but we can keep giving each other the aid, resourcing the aid stations and we'll get across as a team as well. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. I love that metaphor. And next time we wanna see pictures of you doing the triathlon. <laughs> Um, so, as usual, you answered so many of the questions that many of our um, participants had coming into this session, um, but um, there are a few more that we're getting and that I'd love to ask you. So, um, there's a lot of questions about variants and how variants seem to be evolving. Can you just talk a little bit more about the Lambda, the Mu, other variants of concern, and then if there's any evidence that Delta itself is evolving in a way that makes it better or worse? Sure, and yeah, sorry, I didn't um, include any slides. I think partially because the, the latest slides as far as Delta itself are just that it's pretty much everything we're seeing now in isolating. Um, as far as the Mu variant, we have seen, I think close to around 350 or so isolates in California so far, so we're watching that closely. Um, and, you know, continue to expand our ability to do the whole genome sequencing. And we're actually doing some really great work with UC Santa Cruz right now that will, start to roll out um, to our local health departments too, to do genomic trees and really help with on the ground outbreak investigations and really kind of um, better tying sources as well. Um, I have not seen any evidence that Delta itself is um, changing in a way that's concerning. I think many of you have seen as well, there's some early data showing that probably the hospitalization, the risk of hospitalization is higher with Delta than prior variants. So it does seem to be more severe. And as you also probably know, not only is it two more infection, two times more infectious, but you know the viral load is like more like a thousand times what we saw early on. Um, and then it, 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 in that spike protein of the Delta, it seems to really bind even better into our receptors. So it's sort of like in your lungs, it can just do more because it's stickier and can be more invasive. Like there's more of it and it can stick more and get in there. Um, so we're closely watching as far as the other um, variants. There's C12 in South Africa as well that we're watching closely um, and we'll just have to stay tuned. And I think the bottom line for all that is that um, our mitigation efforts as far as masking in high risk settings and other things are gonna work regardless of the variant. Thank you for that. Um, and just to note, we're gonna have um, some people coming next month to talk in, in detail about variants as well, so please stay tuned for that. Um, what about masks these days? So I, I know that for me, as we face this wildly infectious variant of COVID, COVID rather, with Delta, um, and, and also as much of our state is living with dreadfully unhealthy air quality, which we haven't talked about the other health risk that's really facing us right now, and it's making COVID worse among so many other things. Um, I know that I've been looking for a high quality mask for my family. So, so first of all, are there enough N95s for healthcare professionals that we can start using them in our homes and with our family? Because um, my understanding is that's really the mask that helps us with particulates like the wildfire smoke. Um, and then, you know, as I even think about purchasing those or alternatives, but that provide better filtering, it's very hard to find reliable sources and there are all these stories of counterfeiting and stuff. So I just wonder if there's a, um, efforts at the state to think about ensuring a sufficient high quality affordable supply of masks, both for our healthcare providers and also for our citizens. Yeah, great question. We were just talking about this this morning as a next priority area to work on as far as education. Um, I think 
just concretely right now, I would echo that, um, and to answer some of your questions, um, right now there do seem to be adequate supplies of N95 respirators for the healthcare setting. And then I think the other um, kind of area in there, and we do have, we do currently have on our website kind of, um, uh, and of course, fit and filtration are the most important, but and to your point, filtration is really important as for both COVID um, protection and air quality. So really important. And I know the hardest part has been for kids, right? Not having like FDA approved N95s. These KN95s that are out there, um, there are some lists and we'll be updating our information very soon too, um, to show that where they've been tested in the US. Um, and then you just have to, yes, be kind of looking for, making sure they're not counterfeit. Um, I've also seen more reusable um, masks that have either, there are cloth masks as long as you have three layers and then you can, and there are these insertable filters that can do the particulates and then some other more and more evolving. Um, and the ones I've noticed and admittedly for my own family are like out of stock, you have to get on a waiting list, but there's a few out there now that look more comfortable that have a good fit and filtration that are reusable and that can be washed. <clears throat> so I think that is hopefully the, way of the future. And we're definitely talking about this in the context of kids and what we can be doing for schools on that note, because I think we're all concerned about this, This, um, you know, if you do have poor air quality and you, you've been trying to keep the windows open to keep the COVID um, risk low, but now you have to keep the air quality. So I think that's where also indoor, um, you know, filters and filtration will help as well. But yes, we're going to be putting a bigger effort out to help with resources and education and thinking about the equity issues around that as well. Great. Thank you. Um... Just a really specific question. You had mentioned, of course, that it looks like people who have so-called breakthrough cases, so vaccinated individuals who do get COVID, have probably a maybe high levels initially, but a shorter time of infectiousness. And you know, do you have any sense of the data telling us how long are people infectious? And you know, is that are you able to integrate that into state um, recommendations about how long to isolate and things? Yeah, I think um, the CDC, of course, too, is is closely looking at this, and I think it is the kind of thing that we will be looking to and working with the CDC on that. I think there's definitely some early um, early suggestion that the incubation period could actually be shorter with Delta, um, and that, yes, the, the infectious period might be shorter as well. Um, there haven't been any changes at the national level, and we just recognize that it is a big change, um, but we're kind of looking to and hearing from them closely on that. Um, I think one thing I'll mention though too that I haven't seen um, got that put out publicly yet, but is that not there was some data early on like with the Provincetown outbreaks and others, and it is true when you look at CT levels, the cycle time levels um, for vaccinated versus unvaccinated who are infected, um, there has been equal numbers of CT levels, but then there's been some early studies now that um, I just saw on a call in the last few days that when you try to culture those, even though they have the CT values that are the same, the unvaccinated still have, you know, more infectious and more viral replication than the ones who are vaccinated. So it, it does still suggest that while vaccinated people can be infectious, which is unfortunate, we were hoping that wouldn't be the case, um, that they're still less infectious than people who are unvaccinated. The science is just so complicated. It feels like the minute we know something, we scramble to learn something else. So you guys are really on your toes and thank you for that. <laughs> um, let's, speaking of science that's evolving, um, let's talk a little bit about what we know about natural immunity. So a number of months ago, I remember you showed us that California had a zero positivity based on um, tests in blood banks and some other places of 85 or more percent, um, depending on where you were in the state in the previous months. And, and so people are wondering, well, why do we have so much infection from Delta still? Is natural immunity not as strong? So that's one question, how you're thinking about natural immunity. Um, and, and then sort of how, there's been some writing in the press about the fact that, these are really two questions, that natural immunity combined with a vaccine is better than just a vaccine. And so maybe you can comment on those two things. Sure, so um, so one question about what is our zero prevalence in California now? And we, um, we did have to take a pause in looking at our blood bank data. Um, I do think, and we have a new project that um, uh, I think we will be able to have some data very soon to share about zero prevalence in California that I haven't seen yet either. I think that is sort of the question, right, that we're kind of collectively asking because um, there were so many things that happened at once with this Delta surge. We reopened, 
Delta is so much more infectious. Um, the people that we vaccinated initially were also, aside from healthcare workers, the other people that we vaccinated first were people who, um, you know, and as you were seeing in the immunocompromised slides, may have not mounted as good of a response to begin with. Um, so I think trying to sort all that out has been really challenging. And, you know, of course, Israel's published a lot of data, but then there have been some um, different analysis of, of the way those studies were done and the way they've been reported. And so there's there's a lot of kind of active thinking and work on all this, but I think it's really um, a lot of different issues that happen once that it's really hard to sort out the what's confounding the data that we're seeing. Um, one bottom line thing I would say is I do think that this virus, um, and certainly Delta, finds our most vulnerable, finds our unprotected. So, um, and I think as, our, as far as our message to people who are unvaccinated is, you do have a choice, but your choice is really to get infected at some point or get vaccinated. And it is still so much safer to get vaccinated. Um, there's definitely data saying that if you've already been infected and you get a vaccine, it's true, you have an even more robust response. Um, but it can, all the other kind of side effects and serious complications from infection alone are certainly concerning. And the other part, of course, we just don't know about is long COVID <clears throat> and who's at higher risk for those long-term complications. Um, some suggestion that vaccinated people who then become infected may have less of those symptoms, but it's still early on to tell that as well. Did I answer your second question too? Um, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, these questions can't be answered really, so you're doing a great job. <laughs> I always ask you things to, to, that are really speculation, but it's helpful to kind of hear your point of view because you're right in the soup of information. Um, <laughs> so um, what about reinfections? Do we have any data on how many people are getting second COVID infections? Um, the CDC is just modifying the definitions of that, and we're taking a look at how um, in our sort of databases we can look at that. Um, I think at a high level, I'd say it's still very rare. I mean, it happens for sure, um, but it's still relatively rare. Um, but I can't give you numbers off the top, and it is this definition is changing. I think we're still using a 90-day window of, you know, within 90 days, we're not considering a reinfection after that, it would be. Um, so we're... Um, taking a closer look at that and again there's some sort of updated definitions but I think my my general sense from our, our team is that it's still relatively rare okay but more to come on that as is everything else and um, let me let me pivot to kind of response stuff what's the impact of Delta on sort of case investigation you talked about case finding in schools and how that's been really helpful but but I've also heard and read that um, sometimes in, with Delta, case finding is almost irrelevant, but because by the time you go out there, it's already spread to you know three generations away. Yeah, I think the combination of just the the surge, the fast surge, and quickly overwhelming the system in a way, um, along with because um, it's all related. I think the longer it takes to reach someone, and the longer it may have been since you figure out who they might have exposed. Um, so I think we are really working to do more and more. Actually, it's a quick plug um, to sign up if you haven't already to California Notify. There's more and more kind of automated things that are, are trying to help with that, where if you sign up for that, um, you get notified when you get a test, and then you can notify other people that might have been close contacts of you. Similarly, with our tests, we're doing more automated um, notification if we have like a, a cell phone to someone who's been um, tested positive to um, uh, and we are starting to have it in different languages where you can respond and say, you know, I'm a healthcare worker or I live in a nursing home or, you know, those kinds of things to help triage and prioritize and give some initial information, both to you as the person who's tested and what your risks are, as well as helps the local health department prioritize. Um, so it's definitely still a challenge. And I do think we're really, um, as a state, actually working with the locals. I think the priorities really have been now focusing on high risk settings or high priority settings. So skilled nursing facilities, schools, um, other congregate settings that are high risk are really where the priority is to do kind of swoop in and do the most intensive either um, outbreak control or, or case and contact investigation. And it is true. I think um, people have really had to back off and the public has been fatigued. I think at least in the United States and California, people are not answering their phones anymore when public health departments call. So it's really, it's been a double whammy on that. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, what a wide range of work you're doing, and I'm sure you feel like you're learning so much if you can keep your head above water. So um, we will um, thank you and look forward to seeing you again next month, um, and we'll pivot over to seeing Dr. Emily Silverman, but thank you again to you and your team for all the amazing work that you're doing.
Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to all of you on the front lines for seeing patients. And I know everyone is exhausted. So we'll get through this though. Thanks. Bye. Okay, so I am so excited now to introduce Dr. Emily Silverman. Dr. Silverman is an internist at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. She's the assistant professor of medicine at UCSF and the creator and host of The Nocturnists, which is a medical storytelling live show and podcast where healthcare workers share stories of joy, sorrow, and self-discovery. The Nocturnal Nocturnist has been featured on CBS This Morning, Pop-Up Magazine, NPR's Snap Judgment, and in the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Magazine, and Bay Area Science Festival. The Nocturna Stories from the Pandemic series will be archived at the U.S. Libraries of Congress, and its Black Voices in Healthcare series was honored by a Webby Award in 2001. So we're so grateful to be here with a superstar. Um, Dr. Silverman's writing has also been published in the New York Times, the Virginia Quarterly Review, Sweeney's, a local, Rag and many others. Um, Emily lives in San Francisco with her husband, some musical instruments, and many plants. So, um, Emily, I'll hand it over to you and tell us more about what you do. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Emily, and I'm here to talk about uh, The Nocturnus, which is the medical storytelling show that I run, and specifically focusing on some of the work that we've done around storytelling and COVID-19. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So uh, before we talk about the COVID storytelling project, I'm gonna walk it back and just introduce the audience to the Nocturnus and what it is and how it got started, just so you have some context. Um, and then I'll share a little bit about uh, our storytelling work around the pandemic and its impact um, and then we'll play a sample audio clip, so you'll get to hear what one of these audio diaries sounds like, uh, and then we'll pivot into a discussion in Q&A. Next. Um, so this is uh, me with my magical headphones on. <laughs> and uh, the reason I put this picture here is because I kind of fell into the audio storytelling medium by accident. I didn't really think that I would um, get into podcasting or radio or oral histories, um, but it happened really organically. Um, and actually the, the way that it started was through live performance, believe it or not, and not through recorded media. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so this is a photo from the very, very first Nocturnist show in January, 2016. Um, so back then, I was still an internal medicine resident at UCSF, and I came up with this idea kind of out of nowhere. <laughs> I have to say that um, throughout my life as a student, I had always been a little bit on that conveyor belt where um, I would just kind of like get good grades and get into a good college and get into a good med school and get into a good residency and like just do um, what uh, I was told to do. Um, but The Nocturnist was really the first project that I really originated um, and that came up from scratch. And it was really born out of um, some of the burnout that I was experiencing as a resident. So, you know, throughout college and medical school, I was kind of chugging along, happy and healthy. And then when I got to residency about halfway through, um, I really hit a wall and there were a lot of just questions that were coming up for me. Um, some of the questions were predictable. So, you know, what does it mean to, to be a doctor? What does it mean to be a healer? What does it mean to struggle with illness? What does it mean to suffer? What about mortality? Like, how do, how do we think about all those things? Um, so those were kind of the predictable questions that came along with, um, you know, the spiritual development of a doctor in training. But there were a couple of other questions that came up for me that were, less expected. And so one of them was questions about the culture of medicine that were coming up because I was noticing that even though we were in the business of health, you know, you know, theoretically trying to improve the health of others, we were not very good at um, being healthy ourselves and taking care of ourselves, whether that was feeling comfortable calling in sick because we had a medical illness, um, feeling comfortable seeking mental health care for our own mental health issues, 
um, you know, things like sleep deprivation and exercise and nutrition, all those basic things that we know contribute greatly to health. It seemed like um, the very healers themselves, the medical trainees were, were just kind of running their bodies into the ground and that didn't make a lot of sense to me. So that was something that was on my mind. Um, also the fact that um, instead of spending time with patients, I seemed to be sitting at a computer all day. That was not something that I expected uh, when I went into medicine. And then the last thing that came up was um, throughout my medical training, I just started to feel less and less connected to my creativity. Um, I had always been somebody who loved the arts, who loved reading and writing and film and photography and things like that. Um, and I felt like in my medical training, I was very keyed in to the linear and logical and rational part of my brain, very data focused, very evidence focused. Um, but the part of myself that was more playful and creative and spontaneous and improvisational and curious in, in more of like a human way um, seemed to have shut off. And so uh, all of those things together uh, collided and inspired me to start this program. So what I wanted to do was create a space, a physical space where um, healthcare workers, uh, including trainees, but also faculty, could come together and tell stories about what it means to be a healthcare worker today. So in this picture, um, there was about 40 people in the audience and that's me at the front. And uh, I was able to get um, six of my residency colleagues and two faculty to stand up in the front of the room and tell narratives about um, a theme. We had, we had picked a theme for the night. I, I believe the theme was promises. Um, and they just stood up and told their stories and there was no coaching, no preparation. Yeah, I didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, and the bottom line is it was a really, really powerful evening. Um, a lot of people got very emotional. Um, a lot of people felt really connected um, to themselves, to their colleagues and to their jobs and it came up to me afterward and said, when is the next one? So if you go to the next slide. Um, so uh, the project uh, started to grow and grow. So I started to build a team around me. I started to get a little bit of funding um, and then I started to promote the, the shows on like my social media accounts and my, my newsletter that I developed and people really showed up. <laughs> Um, so this is a photo from the Brava Theater in San Francisco, which holds 360 people, I believe. Um, and we were selling out shows without even really advertising that much. And I think that speaks to, um, you know, not just our ability as a team to organize these wonderful events, but also to the hunger in the medical community to be engaging with ourselves and our work and our jobs and our patients through more of a creative and storytelling based um, and narrative uh, and empathetic lens. Um, and so I sensed that when people were showing up to these shows, it was more than just like going to a movie or going to a play or going out for an evening of entertainment. Um, people were showing up out of having a deep need that this programming was, was filling for them. Um, and so, uh, you know, we started to do shows at the Brava Theater, but as I mentioned, they were continuing to sell out. So if you go to the next slide, this is a photo of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, and this was the last show that we did before COVID hit. So this is a photo from January, 2020. <laughs> None of us in that room knew what was coming. Um, I'm very glad that we were able to get in this show before everything collapsed. <laughs> um, but uh, this, was, this was the last show that we did before the pandemic. So this was a sold out show of 700 people right here in San Francisco. And just imagine walking into the theater and looking around and it's packed with healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, social workers, hospital chaplains, pharmacists. Um, since the beginning of the show, we had expanded the program to include more than just physicians, but any type of healthcare worker. Um, and so a really wonderful community building event um, and then the theme for this show was transitions. And so we had uh, eight people stand up and tell stories related to that theme. And by now, four years into this, um, we had developed a process where we would put out a call for stories, select the ones that we liked. We would pair the storytellers with a coach one-on-one -on -one, and they would work together for about 10 hours 
leading up to the performance um, so that when they came out on stage, they had practiced um, and gotten some support and coaching in their storytelling. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so the, the way that this all pivoted toward the audio medium is I kept getting feedback from the audience um, asking, you know, why don't you start releasing some of these stories as a podcast? For a few reasons. One, the shows kept selling out. So if somebody couldn't get a ticket, at least they could listen to the show on the podcast. Um, and also, if people who were not located in the Bay Area, people all around the United States and even in Australia and the UK and other places um, would be able to um, be involved in the storytelling community. So we ended up doing that. Um, we, we launched the Nocturnist podcast and the traditional format was we would select a live story clip from a live show, we would play that. And then um, afterward, I would sit down with the storyteller in the studio, and that could be you know weeks or months later, and we would have a conversation and unpack the story together. And so all of that was about 30 minutes, and we produced three seasons of our podcast in this way, where it was just the story, followed by a conversation between me and the storyteller. And through this, over three, four years, we were able to build a really robust listenership and audience of healthcare workers just outside of the Bay Area and all over the United States. So kind of building this like nervous system of a healthcare worker community uh, around the country. So you can go to the next slide. So then um, when March 2020 happened, um, we realized that we were not going to be able to do live shows anymore. We actually had a live show scheduled um, to be produced in Seattle in May of 2020 that we had to cancel and we haven't done any live shows since for obvious reasons. Um, and so this question came up, which was, okay, this pandemic is coming. What is our role here? How do we continue to serve our community in the way that we've been doing over the last four years? And we thought about doing a similar model where we would have people send in story submissions and then we would give them feedback and craft it and you know, create like the perfect arc um, the same way that we did for the people who performed on stage at our shows. But after talking that through for a while, we realized it didn't make sense because people didn't have time for that. Like people were in crisis mode. Um, they, they weren't able to like sit down and tap into their creativity in that kind of a way. Um, so it was actually our head of story development at the time, uh, the wonderful Adelaide DePuzzolo, who came up with this concept of what about an audio diary? So no, uh, there's nothing needed for um, writing or outlining or plotting or coaching. Just come home from work, sit on your bed, turn off the lights, turn on your phone and just talk into it for five minutes, seven minutes, and just tell us like, what happened today? How are you feeling? What's going on? Um, and so we invited our audience to submit these audio diaries. And like I said, by, by then we had created this, this audience, this community, and we were really, really overwhelmed because the diaries started to pour in. And between the months of March and May of 2020, we received over 700 audio clips from healthcare workers across the United States. Um, and we ended up um, releasing one episode a week for 10 weeks um, during that period, March through May. So really right at the beginning of the crisis. Um, and each episode, it was just an audio tapestry. So we would select a diary. Um, you know, we would pick five or six different entries, diary entries, string them together. That was the episode. It was very raw, very unedited, like very much a guerrilla form of podcasting that we had never done before. Um, and then from that, we produced uh, the 10 episode doc audio documentary series, which we called Stories from a Pandemic. Um, and that was just the tip of the iceberg of this much larger um, audio library that we had. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so then, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention the, the artist who you're looking at these illustrations. She's a fantastic illustrator named uh, Lindsay Mound, who did the artwork for the series. Um, so after the 10 weeks of COVID audio diaries, we paused. Um, somebody mentioned the Black Voices in Healthcare series that we did over the summer in 2020 after George Floyd 
um, was murdered. And that was also a really powerful project, um, which I encourage people to look up if they're interested after this. Um, and then we did a special holiday episode in December 2020 that was uh, COVID themed. And then at the beginning of 2021, we did release a part two of our COVID audio diary series. Um, so just kind of hearing back from people, uh, you know, how have things changed since March? The vaccine was just starting to come out. Healthcare workers were just starting to get vaccinated for the first time. And so we, we called that Stories from a Pandemic Part Two. That was, I believe, eight episodes. Um, and we're envisioning, hopefully, a trilogy, a part one, a part two, and a part three. The part three has not been made yet. We're actually in the process right now of collecting audio diaries from people struggling with the Delta variant. Um, so that audio is trickling in as we speak. Um, so if anybody in the audience is interested in contributing your voice, um, you can uh, get in touch with me afterward or visit our website because that is a library that we're continuing to build. Um, and then as was mentioned in the introduction, we were able to connect with the US Library of Congress who has acquired our audio diary collection as a historical document um, and as a cultural artifact so that um, students and scholars and researchers will be able to refer back to these audio clips and really understand what the experience felt like in the moment on the ground, um, which I think is especially powerful because we acted so quickly that that initial batch of diaries, we really captured people's um, emotions and experiences in the moment, as opposed to, let's say, six months later, having people remember back. Um, rather, these audio diaries were really fresh. People were recording the stories like same day. So, um, so we're really proud of the work that we've done. Um, go to the next slide. I'll just um, let you read a couple of these quotes from our audience, which I think illustrate the impact of the storytelling work on um, our audience. Uh, as you can see here in this quote, um, you know, people say how much the project meant to them, um, preserving the raw moments in time, how that brings people comfort, allowing future generations to understand. Um, how meaningful it is. Uh, so we receive messages like this all the time from our audio diarists about how the act of testimony and storytelling was really able to serve as a healing force for them as they moved through uncertainty. Uh, so you can go to the next quote. Um, so this is a review that we uh, got on Stitcher, which is a popular podcasting platform. Um, this person is not a medical professional, but uh, listened to the podcast anyway and was really grateful for the way that the, the show was illuminating the experiences of frontline workers. So I'll let you read that for a moment. And then uh, lastly, we have this quote um, from somebody in the podcast industry um, who's talking about how our grandchildren might be listening to these audio clips uh, to understand what the world was like in 2020 and um, the impact on healthcare workers. Um, and we have many, many more quotes, but um, I'll stop there and then move on to the next slide. Um, so now we have uh, the audio clip. So I've talked a lot about this project, um, but there's really nothing like hearing one of the clips to give you a sense for the type of material that our team was sifting through um, as the pandemic progressed. Um, so this is a clip called Going Up that came to us from an internist in the Midwest. So um, it's only about two or three minutes long. I invite you to uh, relax, take a deep breath, sit back and close your eyes and just listen to this voice. And then after we listen, we'll um, pivot into the discussion portion of this. So go ahead and roll the clip. Today is April 26th. It's a Sunday, five o'clock. And yeah, I'm in the hospital, even though I'm supposed to be off, but I don't care today because I am 
I'm walking through the basement and I'm looking at a unit of convalescent plasma. Like I'm holding it in my hand and walking it to the ICU right this minute because my hospital is lucky enough to be one of the sites for research that we've got something in our arsenal that we think really works. And it's really cool. I've watched everybody perk up at each stage of this process of, hey, we got registered as a site. Hey, we consented and enrolled our first candidate. But now that, now that it's here, now that I'm looking at it, it feels going up so much better. Um, when I go in to consent another person in another room while we're waiting on it to thaw, I feel hope. We feel energized. And so I think that's what we all need right now because the, the hope and the energy is, is losing it. But, you know, it's, it's those little things. The, the patient that we discharged from the rehab unit to go back to his family who was up and walking and gonna be like his normal self, that, that was a win too, that was a good one. So yeah, I'm really excited to walk through the ICU doors and go hand this off to the nurse who's gonna hang it for our really sick, prone, ventilated patient who is, happens to be one of my primary care patients through sheer dumb luck. Today's a good day. I don't mind being at the hospital today. Just left the hospital. And the sun is out. It's gorgeous outside. But the best thing, the very best thing, the refrigerated trucks are gone. None of us wanted to talk about why they were there in the first place. And we're still gonna lose patience, there's no question there, but things are starting to feel more like we can, we can handle the bad stuff and that there's more good stuff. Great, thank you for listening. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to say thank you to the California Medical Association, not just for having me today, but also for being such a steadfast supporter of the Nocturnus and of our work in storytelling and medicine. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for that presentation. And, and I have to say, I, I sort of want to end our broadcast here because that was such a powerful piece. And it's sort of hard to follow up such obvious art with, with my own words right now. But, but we're going to keep going on. I can handle it. <laughs> you know, um, among the healing professions, we've spent the last decade or more talking about burnout. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, wellness and physician and nurse and nurse practitioner, PA wellness. Can you... You know, you've really done a visceral demonstration of this, but connect the dots for us. Can you talk about how storytelling, sort of improbable maybe to a lot of people who have done this work, helps move caregivers along the spectrum from burnout to wellness, or, or to say it in a way that's been used in the public press lately, from languishing to flourishing, perhaps? Definitely. You know, healthcare workers deal with so many different mental health situations. Um, burnout is one of them, um, but it's not the only one. There's also things like depression, things like shame, things like second victim syndrome um, in the aftermath of a medical error. So there's all sorts of um, stressors, mental stressors that we face as healthcare workers. Um, and then of course, now with COVID, there's gonna be a ton of PTSD if, if not already. Um, and I do think that storytelling helps with all of it, um, but focusing on burnout in particular, burnout has become a really hot topic in the last few years. It's, it's a huge problem. 
And I feel like initially people focused a lot on the individual and individual resilience and things individuals could do to help um, themselves. Uh, and then in more recent years, the conversation has shifted more toward actually, um, you know, how do we talk about systems change? Um, it's actually the system that needs to be more resilient as opposed to the individual. And so I, I know the word burnout itself can be controversial. Some people don't even like the word. They prefer to use the word moral injury. Um, but regardless of what you think about about burnout or the terminology of it, I think we can all agree that it's, it's a, a big problem in medicine and that's only become worse um, now that COVID is here. As for how storytelling can impact um, people, I think we all uh, intuitively understand the healing power of storytelling. Um, if you think about it, human beings have been telling stories for millennia. Um, I think one of the earliest documented stories is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was like carved into a stone, <laughs> um, like, you know, thousands of years ago. And so this question comes up, which is, you know, why do humans tell stories? What, what function does it serve? And I think we all probably feel at a visceral level, but there's also, you know, data to back this up. Um, which is that storytelling is a huge, huge um, way to build uh, connection um, and to build community. So when you're telling a story and it's being received by another, um, there's something really magical that happens at that interface um, between teller and listener, where the teller gets to give it away and the listener gets to take it and sort of project their own experience onto the story and interpret it however they like. Um, and then people find mutual connection there. Um, and I think we all know that um, even though data is super important, um, stories are so much more emotional. And uh, in some uh, research studies, stories have been showed to uh, help people retain um, information better than data and evidence and graphs. So. Um, I think that just shows how human storytelling is and how stories, when they go into us, they really take this like privileged cognitive pathway where it gets integrated into like our entire body and our entire being. And there's something about that that's really pleasurable um, and joyful and healing and that creates connections. So um, using our COVID audio diary program as an example, um, we've heard a lot from people that, um, first of all, just recording the audio diaries into their phone, even if there isn't a listener on the other end, that alone is able to create some movement for people. Um, they're able to kind of move their experience and their trauma through their body in that way. Um, of course, storytelling isn't the only way to do that. A lot of people like to do exercise, for example. Um, there are body-based ways to release that stress and that tension, but um, writing and storytelling is another really powerful way to do that. And so even if it doesn't get published or get viewed, um, those of you who do journaling may uh, know what I'm talking about when I say that um, just kind of taking the experience and putting it outside of yourself and then looking at it, it can help you under understand yourself almost like holding a mirror up to yourself um, in a way that if you just let it bang around in your head, you don't, you don't quite get the same effect. Um, and then further, uh, once people hear their own voice reflected back to them on the podcast, and not only that, they hear their voice next to the other voices of strangers um, who may live in a completely different part of the country and we're all going through this together. Um, people talked about how that was really healing, healing as well because it um, mitigated some of the feelings of fear and some of the feelings of loneliness. Um, I think as a healthcare profession, sometimes we can get really um, trapped in our own uh, shame, in our own fear, in our own trauma. Um, it's not, uh, common for people to open themselves to vulnerability in our profession, but um, 
something about gathering collectively and doing that together in a safe space um, really helps um, people with their healing. So um, those are some thoughts about burnout and wellness and storytelling. Beautiful. You know, even in those those quotes that you gave us, and I'm sure there's so much rich, rich depth in the feedback you get, but some other themes that I heard, certainly, you know, someone was talking about that vulnerability. And I think it's very hard in medicine to show up and be vulnerable in a whole lot of ways. Um, and so giving us a place to do that seems like a super powerful place, as you say, to kind of heal the trauma. Um, but, you know, really preserving the power of the work that we're doing and sort of marking its place in history. Because I think that, you know, we're used to checking off our list and doing what we have to do, but we never take a step back to say, whoa, what I did today was really big and important. And it has a place in history where people want to hear about it again. Um, just makes it feel better to show up work, it strengthens our sense of our mission. So I thought those were some other things that I saw that were interesting and I'd love to dive in deeper about that. But I do have a question about, um, I'm super intrigued about what you're going to see in the stories from COVID part three um, in, a, in a very different moment than that really early vulnerable moment. As you said, you captured it right in its moment, but it's a different moment and, and challenging in its own way. So one of the things that we're seeing now is physicians and other healthcare providers who are increasingly incredibly frustrated treating unvaccinated patients who are getting ill and using healthcare resources. Um, and, and then we're also, you know, seeing, we're seeing the consequences of incredible, incredible amounts of misinformation, of mistrust of physicians in the healthcare system and science and the things that we all value so much. And then the impact of politics on our day-to-day -day practice in medicine. So I, I just, I wonder both how much that story is going to be told in this section and, and some of the tangible ways that this storytelling might be able to really help mitigate the anxiety and stress and frustration around these complex things that are going on in, in our day as healthcare providers. Absolutely. Um, if you look at this moment compared to one year ago, um, it's quite remarkable to see how things have shifted and evolved. And as many people have pointed out, um, you know, over a year ago, the general public was sending pizzas and hand knit caps and uh, you know, banging pots and pans and ringing bells outside their apartments at 7 p.m. To, to show gratitude toward healthcare workers. And now we see you know, people protesting outside of healthcare institutions, um, protesting masks, protesting vaccines. Um, and, and so that, that uh, whiplash, um, is really is really difficult, and uh, the other part of it is with storytelling. I think when the pandemic first hit, people were really hungry to share their experience because it was so new and there was so much fear. And now we've been at this for gosh, like definitely over a year, <laughs> um, and people are exhausted just in general. Um, and I think that can spill over a little bit into just kind of storytelling fatigue and pandemic fatigue. Um, and so we've definitely had to think about like, how do we um, continue to inspire people to send in stories and audio clips um, at this moment in time when, when people are so tired. And so um, there are ways to think about that um, and certainly, if anybody in the audience is interested in sharing their perspective about this particular moment in time, I think it's going to be really important that we keep the narrative thread going um, because there has been so much change. And, you know, there's been now these four waves. And I think in 10, 20, 50 years, looking back at the pandemic, we're going to lose some of the nuance of what each of those waves felt like. Um, you know, the initial wave and then the winter surge and um, now this with Delta. Um, and so kind of using in the moment storytelling to capture like those little micro moments of history will be really important. And um, as you said, there's so many like 
complex layered emotions at play right now. Um, sometimes people wake up in the morning and they feel anger and frustration and hope and fear and gratitude, like all at the same time. <laughs> um, like these emotions are not one note, they can be quantum and they can kind of vibrate simultaneously. And so one thing that storytelling can do is give voice to that experience um, because uh, it isn't a simple, clean narrative. It's very messy. Um, and so uh, I'm very excited to start sifting through the Delta audio um, diaries that have been trickling in over the last few weeks. Um, although I have to admit, it's not um, it's not the, the same deluge that it was in March, April, May of 2020. Yeah, I love that vibrating simultaneously. It feels like that's sort of the story of our lives these days. Um, <laughs> not to get too um, kind of prescriptive about this, because this is really a very um, fluid art what you're what you're producing. But um, do you do you think that of this as a as a medium by which we could learn some lessons, for example, that might improve our ability to combat misinformation? Um, or, or is that asking something different than you're asking from this medium? Yeah, I think about this question a lot, you know, with, with me and my team and the Nocturnus and what we do, like, like, what are we? Like, are we, are we artists? Are we journalists? Are we anthropologists? Um, and I think the work that we're doing does defy categorization. Uh, so for example, a lot of the audio diaries that we receive, um, people elect to be anonymous. Um, it's actually not as common now, but, but certainly at the very beginning of the pandemic when um, healthcare workers were speaking out about the lack of PPE and then the hospitals were cracking down on um, their speech, uh, it was a real risk for somebody to send in an audio diary and attach their name to it because their institution you know, might come after them or something like that. Um, very strict rules about who could say what. And so um, a formal journalism uh, outlet, like for example, the New York Times or um, the LA Times, they don't accept anonymous sources because that's not high quality journalism. Um, they really need to have, usually I'd say, probably 95% of the time, they need to have a name attributed to every quote that they use and every anecdote that they share. Um, but we didn't have to do that because we're not <laughs> the LA Times. So we were able to say, yeah, if you wanna be anonymous, that's, that's totally cool. And so um, in that way, what we did wasn't quite journalism or at least not um, rising up to that same journalistic standard. Um, but, uh, But like, I, I don't know if if art is necessarily the right category either or anthropology. I, I think um, one thing that's unique about our work is just how, how much it really centers the voice of the audio diarist and lets the audio clip and the story and the voice just really breathe and take center stage. Like we're not trying to like pull in headlines. We're not trying to pull in um, arguments. We, we don't have much of an agenda. Um, and, and certainly we don't try to pull in any data, um, unless of course the audio diarist decides that they want to start talking about data and that's built into their audio diary. But um, for example, you know, we haven't really thought of this project as a tool for um, advancing a particular agenda or combating misinformation in that way. We really see it more as like a mirror. Um, you know, it is it is what it is and we wanna know what it is. Um, so uh, that said, um, as I mentioned earlier, stories are an extremely powerful way to persuade and influence. So nocturnists aside, I think as we're, as we're talking about people who have questions about the vaccine um, and how to 
um, you know, get them to to feel comfortable going ahead and getting vaccinated. Um, what's interesting is that data alone may not be enough. Um, we may need to lean into storytelling um, uh, as a way to transmit some of these messages and some of this information. I think one thing that we've definitely seen is that shaming people um, doesn't work. Um, totally understandable why people would feel that impulse because as you said, there is so much anger and frustration and so much dysfunction and so much you know, um, inequity that's happening right now. But talking about evidence-based practices, um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I do think that um, people who are working on communication around the vaccine would benefit from using storytelling as a lens. Wonderful and so nuanced, I love it. Um, so we got a really interesting question that, that I like and that I, I think that this will probably be our last question, but um, one of our CMA members asked, what can we retired docs do to help support docs on the front lines of COVID? Seriously, should we buy lunch, get you a housekeeping? <laughs> um, can you use this for non-clinical tasks, like speaking with families? I, I just thought that was both an incredibly generous notion and also a really interesting question because there are a lot of a lot of retired folks who are sort of probably feeling this existential dilemma of you know missing being on the front lines and this thing, and also that guilt of the survivor's guilt of like, oh, I'm so grateful that I'm actually not exposed to this terrible disease as a provider and all kinds of complex feelings. So I, I wonder, both of you have any insights of the answer to the question, but really like, are you seeing retired physicians and are their stories feeling different? Or it helps Yes, definitely. So in terms of the experience of being sidelined, whether it's because you're retired or for another reason, um, we actually had an entire episode of part one of our series, which was called, oh gosh, what was the title? I don't think it was sidelined, but it was something like that. Um, and it included a variety of voices. Some people, because they were older and retired, other people is because they had a medical issue, so they were stepping back. Um, and I, I have to say for every single ICU attending wrapped in a plastic bag, intubating a COVID patient in April, 2020, um, who, uh, you know, like the, for every retired person who felt guilty that they weren't doing that, <laughs> um, there were just as many ICU attendings doing that who felt guilty for other reasons. Like for example, what if I bring this home and infect my family? Why am I not supporting my kids and their education as much? Um, and so on and so forth. So um, it seemed like no matter which side of it you fall on, there's like all sorts of emotions that come up, including guilt. Um, so just to no take a minute, just to normalize that. <laughs> um, in terms of the question, what can I do to help? I agree, it's a beautiful question and thank you. Um, I would say uh, it would be difficult for me to speak on behalf of another person or another group or another community. And what I might encourage you to do is reach out to your local um, clinics or hospitals or colleagues who you have who are still um, practicing. and and just ask them what they need um, because it, you might be surprised. <laughs> it might be something really simple, like you said, like, you know, buying lunch or something like that. Um, and so just, you know, that open line of communication, like, hey, I really would like to help. What, what can I do? What, what would be helpful to you? Um, and it might be within the medical realm and it might, it might be in more of like the family or community realm. So, um, I think that's probably the best way to go about it. However, um, if you are interested in um, storytelling as an angle, um, we at the Nocturnists are always looking for support for our work. Um, and so if you would like to contribute to um, helping Stories from a Pandemic Part 3 um, be actualized, uh, please reach out to me because there's a lot of different opportunities there. Um, the other project that I'd like to mention is a project we have coming up on the theme of shame in medicine, which I feel is a transitional narrative that's sort of COVID adjacent, but still really important. Um, Cause as I said, I've become very interested in medical culture and how we can use storytelling, not just to heal ourselves and each other, but actually transform the culture of medicine. And I think this um, 
Shame in Medicine audio documentary series, which we're anticipating will be launched in 2020, um, is going to be really powerful. We have um, over 100 contributors already sharing shame stories. Um, we have two shame scholars who have come on. One of them is a philosopher at the University of Exeter. One of them is a, a physician researcher at Duke who looks at shame experiences in medical learners. Um, and then we also have a, a really amazing documentary filmmaker who's come on board to help us execute this artistically. Um, I think that's going to be a really powerful project toward um, just examining the emotion of shame as it manifests in healthcare and then um, talking about how we might move toward um, a culture that uh, lends itself to healthier practices and hopefully um, reduces burnout. So if that's something that's exciting to you, um, please reach out to me as well. Amazing, Emily. Well, um, as usual, we have so many more questions than we have time, but I'm super grateful to you, Emily, and to Erica for presenting today with us. Um, thank you for everyone for listening in and taking time to hear stories and data and facts with us today. Um, and um, I do need to just do some housekeeping. I want to let everyone know that our next session will be on Tuesday, October 12th, and we're going to have several experts really discussing in depth um, COVID variants, our immune response to COVID, um, and some vaccine updates, and any other pressing news at this SARS-CoV-2 continues to bring um, to surprise us. Um, so covidroundca.com is where you can get that. And we'd also, at CMA would also like to invite you to the 18th Annual Network of Ethnic Physicians Organization, NEPO Summit. And that'll be held virtually October 8th in 2021. So the CMA event page is where you go for more information. That, just a final reminder, you'll be sent this survey around five o'clock today, so you can attest to your attendance there and we'll send you your CME, um, CME certificates, or I won't, but the amazing team behind me will. So thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Emily, right in front of me, and Erica, and have a great day.